This morning we are going to go into the book of Matthew chapter 28 and verse 1. The Bible says, early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Amen? So, you know the context. I don't have to explain the context to you. The context is that Jesus has been brutally persecuted, arrested, uh, tried, and then persecuted, and, and ultimately crucified. And then as a consequence, he was also buried. And he has been there for three days. And the first day that the disciples get to get out of the house after the crucifixion is on a Sunday morning. And the Bible says on the Sunday morning, early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, the Bible says there was this one lady called Mary Magdalene. And what she did is she began to inspire others in her gang. And she said, hey, we cannot be sleeping here when a new day is dawning. We cannot be sitting in here and, and, and drinking chai and enjoying our regular routine when the Lord is giving us a new day. This is the day where we go to the tomb. Now, if I was around at that time, I would say, Mary, the, you know, this Jesus, he is dead. He's not there at the tomb. I mean, like, you, you, there's no point of going to the tomb anymore. There is no, nothing new that will come out of you seeing his physical body. See, if Jesus was able to teach you, if he was able to help you, if he was able to uh, minister to you, then it makes sense for you to go to the tomb. But why are you going to a tomb? If you want to pray, you go to the church. If you want to pray, you go to the synagogue, to the, to the more happening places. But, but why do you need to go to the tomb? You know, Mary realized something that had been spoken, had been prophesied that Jesus used to tell about himself saying, hey, in three days I will raise up this body that you are going to destroy. I am going to raise it up. So when Mary, decided, when Mary saw, okay, wait, wait, wait. This is not the same day as yesterday. This is, I'm not in the same season anymore. See, yesterday when I visited the tomb, it would, have been, it would have been the regular old tomb. But now I'm in a new day. So the response, the same things that you faced yesterday, today when you face those things, the response is going to be different. Come on, church. I'm telling, I'm telling you that, you know, you, you may have tried this several times. And, and you, you may have visited the tomb several times. You may have gone seeking for this Jesus several times and you may not see the same response. But this is a new season. Amen. This is a season for us to experience him more and, and receive from him more. And in this season, I'm, I'm here to declare that the, there is a new day dawning upon your walk with God. That there is a new day dawning upon your relationship with God. There is a new season coming into your personal desire to see an encounter with God. That's why I wrote it down over there. The Lord says that a new day is dawning. A new beginning is coming in your walk with God and in your relationship with Him. So those who, those who receive it, you will see the grace to experience it this week. From Monday morning to Saturday morning and until you come back to church next Sunday, you will see how your walk with God is going to soar and it is going to go to another level. It, you're going to experience things that you have never experienced or seen till now. Be prepared for some unnatural, out of the world experiences that you will have. The Bible says... And suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord, he came down from heaven and he rolled aside the stone and he sat on it. So there was an angel of the Lord that came down from heaven. Why did he come down from heaven? So that, uh, so that the people can have a good time? No, he came down with an assignment. His assignment was not to raise Jesus from the dead. Yeah. How many of you know that Jesus doesn't need to 
receive help from an angel. The Bible says, the same spirit of God that lives inside of us is what brought Jesus back to life. So it is not the angel that brought Jesus to life. And if you read about this Jesus, this Jesus could walk through closed doors. So this, this angel did not come to open the door for Jesus to walk out. <laughs> come on church. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? This angel did not come down for Jesus. This angel came down for Mary and her friends who had come to seek an encounter with this Jesus. Do you understand my heart? See, if you are going to be intentional in this season to draw near to the Lord, the Lord is going to send angels your way. Amen. Sometimes those angels will be angels. Sometimes those angels will be men and women of God. Sometimes those angels may look like donkeys. But the Lord will send them to you. And those angels will be used by the Lord to redirect you to the presence of this Jesus. The Bible says he came down from heaven and he rolled aside the stone. Why? Because, see, when Mary and her group, when they are standing outside, they can't see what is inside. They can't see the fact that this Jesus is risen now. But this angel, his assignment was to make the vision clear for Mary to see the evidence of what God is doing in this season. That is what the angel did. And so often we are coming to church week after week, the same thing we are doing week after week, and we are praying day after day, and we are worshiping day after day, and we are reading the word day after day. But in this season, the Lord is releasing some people who will come and open your vision up, Amen. who will come and open the tomb door up so that you are going to see things that you have never seen before. You are going to see what the Lord is doing. You are not going to be blind anymore. The Bible says his face, this angel's face, it shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. Isn't that a glorious person that you want to encounter? The Bible says that the guards that were, you remember the story how there were guards at the, at the tomb. The guards, they saw that face and what happened to them? Says the guards they saw and they shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Okay, who is this? The guards. They saw this angel and they could not take it. They couldn't accept it. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't process this whole thing. And so they went into a mode of fear. They went into a mode of negativity. They went into a mode of questioning everything. They went into a mode of, of total confusion. Where they are now dead. They, they're, like, they're like alive and yet they are dead. That's what it says. That they, they did not die, but they almost died. <laughs> they, they are alive, but they're walking. They're looking like dead people. Why? Because... Let me tell you that in a minute. It says, the next line, it says, Then the angel spoke to the woman. What did the angel speak to the woman? Don't be afraid, he said. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. So, so what was the difference between the, angel, the, the guards and the woman? The woman came looking for Jesus. The guards, they were not looking for Jesus. And I'm telling you, if you're not looking for Jesus in church, every time you come, you will, not, you will only go back with more negativity. You will only go back with more confusion. It's, it's better you don't come to church if you're coming to just enjoy or have a good time than for you to come and go back with a lot of confusion and a lot of animosity and a lot of problem and a lot of challenges. Am I talking to somebody's hearts this morning? Yes. The Bible says these women that came early in the morning, 
You know, it, it was not one person that came, multiple people that came. One person inspired the other, other person started talking to the other woman and they all packed their bags and their incenses, the fragrances, everything. And they, they did a party at the tomb. They went for a, a picnic to the tomb. And because they went looking for Jesus, my question to you is, do you come to church looking for Jesus? Do you read your Bibles looking for Jesus? Do you pray looking for Jesus? Do you worship looking for Jesus? Or do you just do it for the sake of it, like everybody else does? Because it's my duty to guard the tomb. It's my duty to lead worship. Or it's my duty to be in church today. Do you just do it because it's, it's part of your duty? Or do you do it because you love this Jesus and you're looking for an answer. You're looking for an encounter. You're looking for a revelation of who Jesus is. If you are like that, then the Bible says that you are going to find an answer. You are going to receive a revelation. You are going to see a change in your circumstances. You know, depending on the level of your pursuit of Jesus, you will have different responses to the same revelation. So two people can come to church and hear the same word, the same sermon, the same revelation. But depending on who you came looking for, you will get two different answers. You will go back in two different ways. We are here looking for the presence of Jesus. We are here desiring to inch a little more closer to the face and the person of Jesus. Amen? And depending on the level of your pursuit, you will either see and go back happy or you will go back confused and upset and with struggle. The Bible says in verse 6, this, this angel, he said, he isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Just as he said it would happen. Come, come, see. I have already opened the grave. Why don't you come and see where his body was lying? This is where he was supposed to be. Why don't you come and see for yourselves? And now, what did this angel do? This angel, the Bible says, the angel told the woman, now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there and remember what I told you. So what is this angel doing? What is the purpose of this angel coming? The angel came because a few women, they moved the heart of God. And the angel came to tell this woman where to go, what address to take, which place, what time to go, and where they can find Jesus. And what did the angel say? Why don't you go to Galilee? Because this Jesus, he is going ahead of you. Do you know that this Jesus came ahead of you to church this morning? How many of you came late to church this morning? But do you know that Jesus came even before the earliest, the first person came to church this morning? He came. He went ahead of you. Because he is more interested in an encounter with you than you are interested in an encounter with him. And from time to time, he is going to withhold himself to see how much you desire for it. How much you desire to go after him. How much, you know, God told Moses, I'll give you my angel this angel is going to fight your battles. This angel is going to provide for everything that you need. But I'm not going to come with you. And Moses, on behalf of the entire nation of Israel, I'm very, very thankful that Moses did not call for a democratic vote saying, is this okay? Because the whole nation of Israel would have said, oh, that's a perfect solution. We don't have to obey everything God says. We don't have to do all these things. But the angel will give us all the benefits. This is perfect. But then Moses said, no, 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 God. It's okay for us to remain here in the wilderness. Do you remember I told you something last Sunday? It's better to be a corpse in the wilderness than to be a slave in Egypt. And Moses, Moses told God, God, it's better that we remain here in the wilderness than to go into a place where your presence doesn't lead us, where your presence doesn't go ahead of us. And the angel told this woman, why don't you go ahead? Why don't you... 
you know, go this way and why don't you go and prepare the rest of the disciples. Tell them that Jesus wants to meet them also. Because, see, if God wants to meet you, you, you may wonder why is it that God just, just doesn't come? Why does, why does people have to come and tell us that God is about to encounter me? Do you know what is God doing here? What is God doing here? God is using this woman to prepare the disciples for an encounter with Jesus. What was their task? To go and tell the disciples that Jesus is coming to meet you. Today I am doing the role of Mary Magdalene. Today I am doing the role of this woman. I am here to tell you that Jesus is about to meet you. So you better prepare yourself. You get your faith ready and receptive. You know, and, and, and it required for a few women who are going to be passionate to pursue God, to reach that place where they are like, okay, now God is going to send a message to this woman so that they can go and prepare the rest of the group, the rest of the disciples, who is going to go and prepare a group of 500, 120 people, who is going to now go ahead and evangelize the whole known world in their day and time. The Bible says, the woman ran quickly from the tomb, but they were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. So, so you see this woman who didn't come expecting all of this. They came expecting a regular Sunday service. They came expecting the tomb to be closed. They came expecting Jesus to be in the tomb and they would probably apply some incense and fragrance and they would go back home. They did not come expecting all of this. The Bible says that because of their encounter, they were very frightened. But also, somebody say, but also. also. Come on, loudly, say, but also. also. You know, as long as we can remain in that tension of, I'm frightened, but also filled with joy. Yes, I, I don't have money, but I know I am rich in Christ Jesus. Hey, I, I, I feel all alone, but I know that God will never leave me and forsake me. See, this may be my reality. My reality may be that I am challenged because of my circumstances, but I'm going to be a Christian that, that's going to say, but also. But also. Somebody say, but also. You know, you need, you need to add a but also to all of your confessions starting from today. You may, you may say, you may go back home and check today. So your pastor prayed for healing. And I go and check my levels, my thyroid levels or my, my bone issue, whatever it is. I, I check it and I, I don't see the answer. But I would rise up and say, wait a minute. I don't feel healed, but also the word has been released that I'm being healed this morning. You know, in every confession, if you can stand up and declare a but also to your statements, I'm telling you, see, God's original plan was this. If you read the previous verses, what do you see? Jesus told them, sorry, the angels told them, go and speak to the disciples that I'm going ahead of you to meet you in Galilee. But because this woman, they did not have just a natural response. They added a but also. They said, no, 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 this, this news is too good for us to be frightened only. I understand the fright is natural. See, I'm not condemning your physical issues or your physical limitations. I'm not looking down on you because you have an addiction or because you have a, a, a sin issue or a problem. I'm here to tell you, will you, will you not stop with that? Will you rather add a but also to your limitations? And will you say, I'm not going to define myself with my challenges. This is not my identity. My identity goes beyond where I am today. This is what I'm struggling with, but also the man of God told me I am healed. This is what I'm facing today, but also Jesus paid for my sins. Oh, this is what I am looking at day and night. I don't have any money. I don't have any resources. But also, I know that I can do all things. That God will provide for all my needs according to His riches in glory. 
Do you have a but also in your life? The Bible says because these guys had a but also, the next verse it says, as they went, who came? Jesus met them and greeted them. Wait a minute. The angel gave us wrong information. The angel said, Jesus will meet you with the disciples. Where? In in Galilee. That's a, that's a really far off place. Right now, they are in Jerusalem. And right now, Jesus changes the plan because there were some people in this group that was a but also guys. They were not willing to let their limitations limit them. They were saying, I'm limited, I feel limited, but I'm going to rejoice in Jesus. I I feel challenged, but I'm not going to remain challenged. I'm going to sing a hallelujah in the middle of my storm. I will raise a hallelujah in the middle of the storm. And the Bible says, Jesus came to meet with them and just to give a greeting. Nothing. There was no special reason for Jesus to come. He, Chumma, came to show off. To these guys that I love those that are passionate about my presence. Is anybody catching this? Is anybody receiving this this morning? The Jesus encounters belong to those who will rise up with a but also confession. Are you ready for this this week? If you can, if you can. You know, Job, the Bible says, Job stood before God and said, Even if you will slay me, I will wait on you. Who says that? Who in that logical sense says that even if you kill me, I will still trust you? You say, I'll trust you till this point, right? I will follow you till I have money. I will follow you till I have help. I'll follow you till I have support. But here is Job who says, no. I know that my Redeemer liveth. I don't see the answers, but also I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know that I will see him face to face. Verse 10 of the same chapter, the Bible says, Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee. They were all in Jerusalem. And Jesus telling these women, Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. Now, you understand, right? This is a repetition of the previous message. Jesus was not supposed to or scheduled to meet these girls. But because of their response to what they were experiencing. And I, I like the fact that they were, that's not just one person. I'm not saying God doesn't encounter one person alone. God does do that. And, you know, if you read the context, there was... The Bible talks about how Jesus met Peter personally. Did you know that Jesus met Peter personally? And it's not recorded in the Bible. It's not recorded in the Bible. You just say that Jesus met Peter. Nobody knows what happened in that transaction. Do you know that Jesus also met James? But nobody knows what happened. But this this group encounter is recorded for your benefit and my benefit. And I believe that these are the days when we will experience group encounters. If we are willing to pull and push one another into the presence of God. And say, hey, I know, I know it's tiring. We've had a late night Zoom call. But can you, can you wake up a little early? We, we need to go ahead of where Jesus is going. Let's, let's go and have a revelation. Let's go and see what God is doing. See, it is in the pursuit of the regular, old, mundane, dead Jesus that they got to see a living Jesus. You know what we are all waiting for? If Jesus shows up, if the presence of God comes, I mean like, you know, blow us out of our waters, then we will come. Show us some signs that God is in the house. Show us some miracles, man. Show us some wonders. Don't tell me to come for an ordinary Sunday service. Nobody wants to come for a... Ordinary Sunday service. Let me tell you this. It's not the revelations of Jesus is not for everybody. Because, see, thousands of people came when Jesus was doing miracles. Right now, even the disciples themselves don't have the guts to be at the tomb. It was a few ordinary women who are going, seeking a dead Jesus. 
And this encounter with the living Jesus was reserved for those few women who continued to pursue Jesus even when they didn't feel the goosebumps, even when they didn't receive the answers, even when they didn't hear all the good things, and even when they didn't see or feel any presence of God. And what are you guys talking about God is here? I, I, I can't see anybody. I can't understand anybody. But if you will keep going, if you will keep going, if you will continue to pursue, then you will experience and encounter this resurrected Jesus. Amen? And then the Bible says in Luke chapter 24, verse 15, that same day, two of Jesus' followers, the same day, Sunday morning, you remember Sunday, Sunday morning? Now the Bible says that same day, two of Jesus' followers, these guys are not pursuing Jesus, but they are walking with one another. It says they were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. It's a long walk, seven miles. So it's about 11 kilometers of walk. And these guys are walking with one another. You remember the, 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 the few women that were walking, inspiring one another, went to Jesus? And these guys, they are walking for a few kilometers and a few hours, and they're walking with one another. And it says, as they walked along, they were talking about everything that happened. They were not just walking. They were engaging in conversations with one another. They were talking about what is happening. They were talking about what is going on in the city. They were talking about what God is doing. And the Bible says, as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. Wait a minute. God, these guys don't deserve an encounter. <laughs> these guys are not even going looking for the encounter. These guys are not even, uh, you know, believing what Mary, you know, that Mary and the woman, they came and told everybody. And the Bible says Jesus had to rebuke them for their disbelief at the end of the day when Jesus came because nobody believed Mary. Nobody believed the woman that saw Jesus. Nobody believed him. And so Jesus had to come and rebuke them. So here are two people who have heard the news that Jesus met a couple of women. But they're like, women, no. Sunday morning, they should have slept a little extra. <laughs> Why is it that all the women find it funny and all the men are like seriously looking at him? But, but they didn't believe this woman. These guys don't deserve an encounter with Jesus. And still, you see that Jesus came. What did they do? How did they attract that oil? What did they do to attract that presence of God to come and manifest for them? It says, as they walked, they, were, they talked about Jesus. They talked about what is happening. They talked about what was going on. You know, they, 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 were, not, they were not disconnected from the, the things of God. My qu question to you is this. What, what is your regular conversations at home? What, what fills your regular conversations on your dining table? That will tell you if Jesus would like to come and join the conversation or not. What is it that you guys talk about? What is it that you, you, you do on your group chats, on WhatsApp, Telegram, wherever you are? What are you, what are you conversing about? Would Jesus want to be part of that conversation? Can you imagine? This is also not scheduled, right? Did Jesus tell the woman that I have a plan to go to Emmaus? If anybody wants to see me there, they can walk. No. The, the conversation between these two guys was so interesting that Jesus said, Oh, wait. I need to be in this conversation. And Jesus showed up and suddenly he came and began walking with them. So, so let, me, let me tell you this. The person that they were, you know, there were two people that were walking. The person that they were walking with, when one disciple, one's, one's name is mentioned, his name is Cleophas. When he was walking with, let's say, give me another name. Mark, okay. So, so Cleophas and Mark, there are two people walking. When Cleophas is walking with Mark, he's saying, I need to find a guy. This is a long journey, right? I need to find a guy who can talk to me about Jesus. 
I don't want to find any person. I, I, I want to walk with somebody who has an understanding on what we are going through. So, so when he decided to get in this journey, he got into that journey with somebody who, is, who has the same passion and the same heart, who would not say, hey, you, you're such a boring guy. You're talking about Jesus all the time. You're, you're just, you know, just talking about church and God and kingdom and glory and gospel and all of this boring stuff all the time. No, he, he, he looked for a person who has the same passion that he had. Not only did he look for a person like that, the, the topic of the conversation also mattered for Jesus to join the conversation, for Jesus to feel comfortable. So that's why I'm saying that the object and the subject of my fellowship prepares me for an encounter with Jesus. See, when these guys, the, the object of their fellowship was one another, right? The, they, were, they were fellowshipping with each other in their journey. It's a long walk. They are fellowshipping with each other and the subject of their fellowship, the topic of their conversation, the, the matter, the content that laid the foundation for their conversation was also important. So can you read it with me? The object and the subject of my fellowship prepares me for an encounter with Jesus. See, it's not that God doesn't want to encounter you. The question is, are you preparing yourself? Are you fellowshipping in the right environment? Are you fellowshipping with people that are going to question your faith and diminish your faith? Or are you going to fellowship with people that are going to fuel that faith? That are going to add to that faith? Who are you fellowshipping with? And what happens in that fellowship? How do you have your conversations in that faith? What kind of conversations do you entertain in that fellowship? That is very important. And the Bible says, Jesus showed up, but God kept them from recognizing him. Do you remember we read this last week also where God came from the front to the back, where God was supposed to be leading them, but God just suddenly withdrew. It's not like, you know, they did something wrong and God withdrew. No, God intentionally kept them from recognizing him. That, that scares me that sometimes we may have a revelation of Jesus and we may not even know that we had a revelation of Jesus. Because the Bible says God wanted to be intentionally part of this conversation and see where this will go. Where, whether these guys will entertain him. And when, when you have... When you've been hospitable, you know the story of how Abraham was hospitable to three normal looking ordinary people and these three guys turned out to be angels and out of the three, one turned out to be God himself who will stay back and have a conversation with them. He didn't, see when he cooked a meal, he was not expecting like a whole theological discussion and you know, having a, having a revelation about what is going to happen in Sodom and Gomorrah. No, he was just doing a regular old good hospitality that day where he said, no, I, I, want to, I want to serve you a good meal. Can you stay back? The Bible says God intentionally stopped them from recognizing that this was Jesus. So sometimes God's presence will come, but you may not see it. Will your response to God and to his people remain the same when God's presence is there or not there? Will your response to what God is speaking and doing, will it remain the same when you can see signs and wonders and, and encounters and glory coming and when you don't see that? Because the Bible says these guys, they didn't care that this was not Jesus. See, if, if they knew that this was Jesus, they would have still persuaded him to go and have a meal with him. But... As ordinary as this guy was, they persuaded him to go and have a meal. It says that Jesus acted like he was going on. That he didn't want to have a conversation. For, that he is going somewhere else. He acted like he didn't want this anymore. It was a test, my friends. They would have never known that they had an encounter with Jesus. How many encounters have we missed? How many encounters have we not even recognized? Because we did not press a little further. Because we didn't push a little further. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? Come on, Jesus, don't you know? 
But Jesus played along. Jesus wanted to know what are they going to say. And the Bible says they stopped short. Sadness written across their faces. See, you remember a group of women that went in the morning. They had fright, but also joy. But here is a group of guys who are supposed to be more brave, more courageous, more bold and all. And the Bible says they had sadness written all over their faces. Then one of them, his name was Cleophas, he replied, you, you, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard. You know, some of us are very good at giving Bible studies to God. We, we are very good at updating God what is the latest development in our home and in our church. And we try to teach God. Saying, God, just in case you didn't know, I prayed for so long. Just in case you didn't know, I did this, I did that. I put so much offering. God knows it. God wants to still hear it from you. And the Bible says, then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. Somebody said, ouch. You foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scripture. So these guys are not unaware of what the prophets wrote in the scripture, but because they did not believe. They had the information, but they did not trust that information because they did not have faith for that information. So, they, so this sadness was normal. It is okay to be sad, but because they did not have a but also that will be an element of faith in their life, Jesus told them, you foolish people, can I, can I say this out? Your lack of faith is the most foolish state in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, the, 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 the fact that you don't have anointing or you, you can... No, 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 that, those are not the important things. The important thing is, do you have faith? If you lack faith, then the Bible calls you foolish. Because it is impossible for us to please God without faith. And if we, if we can exercise faith by saying, God, this is what I'm going through. But also, your word says so and so and so and so. I believe this. Yes, this is what I feel right now. But your word says. But also, your word says. But also, the prophet said. But also, when I was praying, you showed me a vision. But also, you know, God would come and say, hey, I, I just wanted to come and greet you. I just wanted to come and hang out with you. Here, Jesus comes with a warning. He calls them foolish people. And in fact, the, the, the humility of these guys got tested at that point. They did not rebel. Who are you to call us foolish? We've, we haven't even seen you in our fellowship anytime. You've, you're, the, you're, you're like a newcomer in our church. How dare you question my faith? You have, you have no idea what all I have done. In this church. You know how long I've been a member here? Ask anybody. You'll find my pictures three years back on Facebook. <laughs> but these guys, they were humble enough to submit to an unknown Jesus. To a person who they did not know. And say, okay, is that true? Then explain. The Bible says, Jesus told them, wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would come to suffer all these things before entering the glory? So what is Jesus doing for them? Clearing their perspective. You understand? Mary came to the same tomb that she has been before, but this time they could see inside. They could see what was inside. Now the Bible says these two guys, they are talking about the same information that they've always spoken about. Now Jesus, he's clearly opened up the vision for them to see and understand. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That Sunday evening, somebody says Sunday evening. It's time for the show, right? So it began on Sunday morning. There were a group of women that God encountered. And then in the afternoon, there were a group of men that God encountered. Because of their conversations, God encountered them. And that Sunday evening, the Bible says, the disciples, they were meeting behind locked doors. Why? 
Can you see the comparison? The disciples, they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, so they were in locked doors. And here is a group of women who went to see this Jesus boldly during daytime. This is an evening time, by the way, right? They don't have to be afraid right now. But, the, but because these disciples, because they came and they, they were like out there and, you know, they, they had seen everything that happened to Jesus, they, they had like, they were behind locked doors. And the Bible says, suddenly, somebody said suddenly. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. And he said, peace be with you, he said. Amen? Amen. So I'm praying for this. I'm praying that you and I, we will, we will reach that point in our journey with God where we will experience a suddenly moment. There will be a suddenly, all of a sudden. You've been doing this for a long time, but all of a sudden you would find Jesus standing and greeting you. All of a sudden, your eyes will be open to see that it was Jesus who was sitting and talking to you all this while. You may be in a, in a locked door, locked home where you do not allow access to Jesus. But suddenly, there will be a shift. Are you ready for that this season? Come on, pray. Lift your hands and say, Lord, give me that suddenly movement, Lord. I, I want that suddenly encounter, that suddenly encounter. I'm not satisfied with yesterday's anointing. I'm not satisfied with yesterday's blessing. I need that suddenly movement. Yes. You are the resurrected king. You are the resurrected Jesus. I invite you, Lord, to give me that suddenly movement. Lord, we want to have a suddenly encounter with you, a suddenly encounter with you. Just like Mary had, just like these, this Cleophas and his friend had, just like the disciples had, we need that suddenly encounter with you, Lord. The Bible says, and as he spoke, he showed them what? The wounds in his hands and his side. What should they naturally do? They should be sad, right? The Bible says, but they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. You cannot see Jesus and be unhappy. You cannot encounter Jesus and remain sad. You cannot be walking with God and say that I don't have happiness or fulfillment in my life. No, 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 that's not possible. You're walking with the wrong Jesus. Amen. You may be frightened, but you will be filled with joy. Amen. You may not have all the answers, but I'm telling you, you will be leaping with joy in the midst of all your struggles. So joy is a natural result to a personal or a public relationship and an encounter with Jesus. It's a natural result. And what did he do? And he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. He sent them and now he is breathing on them and he is releasing them to represent him to the entire world. See, if you, if you understood, there's a pattern in all the three encounters that we noticed today. Well, the one thing that stood out for me is that all the three encounters happen in groups. It happened when two or three gathered in his name. Do you remember I told you something? The, ob the object of your fellowship, who you fellowship with, and the subject of your fellowship will prepare you for an encounter with Jesus. So all the three places, irrespective of whether they were prepared for an encounter or not, whether they had enough faith for that encounter or not, whether they had the right attitude towards Jesus or not, because in one place they shut the door, they kept Jesus out, they did not want anybody to come in, right? Irrespective of all of those things, the fact that they were fellowshipping with one another in the name of Jesus welcomed the presence of God in that place. Isn't that amazing? That three women who would just, you know, have a hunger for the presence of God. Jesus will show up there. Two men who are talking about this Jesus and who has no clue about the prophecies and they, they don't have any faith. 
but Jesus would show up. And the whole group, a whole church that has shut their doors to Jesus, Jesus standing outside. And but because they would gather there in all their fear and all their struggles, the Bible says Jesus would come and breathe upon them and release his peace upon them. And suddenly there will be a shift of atmosphere. So if there is one thing we need to get right in this season is our object and the subject of our fellowship. If we can become clear about how we're going to relate with each other, we will be able to host God. Yes, you can host God by hosting the Holy Spirit in your life like Mary did. Yes, you can host God by by taking the help of those people that will lead you to the river and you can be dedicated, you can just commit yourself to the river, you can experience rivers of living water. Yes, when we come together, when we worship God, His presence comes down and we can encounter Him. But there is one more thing about our coming together. Even if we don't sing any songs, even if we don't have a lot of sermons to preach, if we can be of one mind, if we can just come together and, you know, in all the three, their goals were the same. If you noticed, there was no disagreement as to where the woman wanted to go. The, there were no disagreement about what the men wanted to discuss. There were no disagreements about what the group wanted to do in that house. They were all together. They were all in oneness. And that was a breeding ground for Jesus to show up. And I'm telling you, it's hard to do that. It's easier to fast and pray for 40 days <laughs> than to be in unity with the same group of people from morning to evening. All of you are staring at me saying, Pastor, I don't even know what you're talking about. I mean, <laughs> I have a perfectly functioning relationship with everybody in my church. I never fight with anybody and I, everybody understands me all the time and I understand everybody. What are you talking about? You don't understand this, but I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to somebody in this place. I, I hope you catch this. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 18. He said, if another believer, if he sins against you, what do you do? Go on your Facebook page and... <laughs> don't put a post, but only a story, so it will disappear in 24... That's what Jesus said, right? What did Jesus say? Go privately on a DM, not on the wall. <laughs> Go privately, personally, reach out to that person and point out that offense. I didn't, this hurt me. Instead of saying, you are a bad person, just say, hey, this hurt me. This was offensive to me. This, I didn't expect you to do this to me. I was not, I, I was not, you know, ready for this. This was hurtful. Go privately to that person to point out that offense. If the other person listens and agrees and confesses it, you have won that person back. Praise God, the relationship is sorted. So the first thing you should do is privately approach that person. Don't make it public immediately. Privately approach that person. You remember Joseph privately approached Mary to call off the engagement. Not publicly. He didn't make a public affair of the whole thing. Privately approach the person. If you, if you get it, Right that time, you win the person back. But if you are unsuccessful, then take one or two more people with you. You may want to take Pastor Kachi and uh, Pastor, <laughs> all the, all the, all the well-built people in the church along with you, just to intimidate them. You know, that's how we choose people, right? I'll show you my man. I'll take the pastor and come, you know. I'll, let me see what answer you will give that time, right? He says, no, if, you, if you're unsuccessful in that attempt, you know, why don't you sit in a group, take a few other people and talk it out. If you're unsuccessful, take one or two others, one or two others maximum with you and go back again. So why? So that all three of you can accuse that other guy? No. Why? So that everything that you say can be, you will still be the one talking. Not all, it will not be three people accusing that one person saying, oh, you're wrong. You're, no, no, no. You're still the one talking, but you have witnesses to confirm that you apologized or that you were ready to sort this issue out. Right? 
So it's not just between you and that person now. You tried sorting out personally, but now you're taking the help of a few more people who can be witnesses to your conversation. So you create a group chat. It's easy, no, to do it now and nowadays. You just create a group chat and say, okay, I'm having this struggle. Please, if you guys can just be part of this conversation, I'd like to sort this out. And then the Bible says, if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. That is when you go to the pastor. Because that is when you want a judgment on this. It says, then he or she, then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, then you treat that person as a pagan or as a corrupt tax collector. You disconnect from that person. No problem. That is even after listening to a counsel. See, to the church, you do not come for mediation. The church, you come for a decision saying, okay, give us a word. What should we do about it? The pastor says, it's not a big deal. Drop it, then you drop it. The pastor says, no, you have to, you have to bless him. You have to give him some money, get this sorted out, then do it. And if you're still not willing to do that, then the Bible says, then finally, you treat that person as somebody that you do not want to engage in a relationship with. You know, we jump to point number three. We begin with point number three. Yeah. As soon as somebody offends me, man, I'll just stay away from this guy. No wonder we are not seeing a revival. No wonder we are not seeing the presence of God come through. The Bible says that that decision is, submitting to that decision is very crucial. When that decision comes, you know, Paul would do this. Paul would say, gather the whole church and release a decision. Because I'm going to be there. Whatever you guys decide, it's like me deciding. And whatever I decide, it's like God deciding and pronouncing a judgment. In fact, Paul discouraged the church into going into court battles. Did you know that? Paul said, why are you guys going to court battles? Why can't you just go to your elders? Why can't you just go to your pastors? Let them be your judges. Do you understand what happens in a court of law, right? That's a legal procedure like police get involved and it's like, you know, it's like legal. But Paul says, hey, you guys don't need that. You need the church leadership. If you have a problem with somebody else in the church, you go to the pastor or you go to the elders. Let them pronounce a judgment and whatever they say is final. And if they don't accept that, then you treat that person. See, you, see the only time you treat somebody as a pagan or as a corrupt tax collector is if they refuse to submit to something that your pastor has told them to do. You understand, you understand the perspective? Not because they didn't look at you, not because they didn't shake hands with you, not because they didn't like you. No. If the pastor gave them an instruction in front of you and you see that person violating that instruction, violating that order, then you, then you have the legal grounds in Jesus' teaching, to disconnect from that person. Till then, you and I, we have to learn to work with one another. Why? It says in verse 16, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus speaking to them, okay? He says, I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid here on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So whatever the church permits or whatever the church forbids, so it shall be in heaven. Not the other way. You know, Jesus taught us to pray a prayer saying, let it be on earth as it is in. Amen. That's not what we are doing here. It says, whatever you do here, it will be done so in. You know, we use that in prayer. We think that, oh, this is speaking about prayer. It's not. It's speaking about church decisions. Whatever decisions we release from the pulpit here, saying this be so. The Bible says, whatever you forbid here, it will be forbidden up there. Whatever you permit here, it will be permitted up there. That's why the leaders, those who make decisions, they have to be so careful what they speak, what they release, what they judge, how they discern people and how they release something over people's lives. And it goes on to say, I also tell you this, if two of you, read this with me, this is very important, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything that you ask my father somebody say my father in heaven he will do it for you what do you need to do 
agree. That's it. Two people, not, not, not ten people, not thousand. Two people. One Cleophas and one Mark is enough. Two people. Will you agree on one thing? Will you agree that we need more revelation on this topic? Will you agree that we need to go to the tomb tonight? Will you agree that let's just gather together to pray? Let's, let's forget everything else and be of one mind right now. Two people. Will you agree here on earth concerning anything that you ask? My father in heaven, he will do it for you. What? Why? 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 Come on, give me the next verse. This is the crux of today's sermon. It says four. Everybody say four. four. See, whenever a statement begins with four, it means we need to read the previous verses. Don't quote the verse out of context. Read the previous verses. What is talking about in the previous verses? It's talking about unity, about reconciliation, how there should be agreement, how we have to be of one mind. And it says four, where two or three, they gather together in agreement, in forgiveness, with reconciliation, with no hidden agendas, with no unwanted motives. When they gather together as my followers, they have the right object of fellowship and they have the right subject for their fellowship. The Bible says, I am there among them. God is looking for two or three people in the church this morning. Not, not a lot, not 200 or 300. That's why I said, if, you, if, you, if you're here with the wrong motive, it's okay if you don't come. That's why I was bold enough to say that. Because if we are looking to host Jesus in the church, we are looking for two or three. That's all. Two or three who are willing to agree. I want nothing else. I just want Jesus. Jesus.